Welcome to the Triple Point Podcast, a podcast for those working at the intersection of weather and climate, technology, and society. We focus on innovators and leaders working to make our communities safe and resilient in the face of a dynamic and ever-changing world. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Cunningham. And I am Ryan Harris, and this week we are transitioning from our last episode on the hurricane hunters to a hot topic lately, the Arctic. Marisol Maddox from the Wilson Center is our guest today, and we're also excited to have Dr. Eric Hunt as a guest host for this episode. Dr. Hunt is a climatologist from Lincoln, Nebraska, with a PhD in natural resources sciences from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Eric is an assistant extension educator of agriculture meteorology and is an instructor for climate in crisis at UNL. Previously, he worked over 10 years as a climatologist in the private sector for Verisk Atmospheric and Environmental Research. Jeff and I are stoked that Marisol was able to join us on the triple point. Marisol Maddox is a senior Arctic analyst at the Polar Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Her research considers the nexus of the Arctic, climate change, security, and geopolitics. She is particularly interested in how the growing presence of actorless threats, such as climate change and biodiversity loss, interplays with traditional security challenges and strategic thinking. Ms. Maddox is a non-resident research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security and a term member for the Council on Foreign Relations. She currently serves as a core expert on the Arctic and hybrid threats for the European Center for Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. She regularly teaches at the Department of Defense Regional Center, the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies, and the Geneva Center for Security Policy. In this show today, we cover quite the territory, from the effect of Russia's invasion on Arctic cooperation to the zombie apocalypse. It may not be World War Z, but we think we have a pretty entertaining episode. For now, on with the show. Hey, good morning, Marisol. Welcome to the Triple Point Podcast. The first question we always like to ask our guests when we bring them on is, how do you summarize your journey? How did you get to the point where you are looking at Arctic security um, for the Wilson Center right now? Yeah, thanks so much, first of all, for having me. I really appreciate the invitation to join you. And um, yeah, looking forward to this discussion. So how I would summarize my very unconventional journey is that basically I really started off um, really being interested in, in studying agricultural systems and looking more at um, the kind of links between local resilience and agricultural practices and the carbon sequestration potential of soils and looking at the, the way that land management practices affect water quality. And I worked on um, farms and ranches around the U.S. and I did environmental studies in undergrad. And I really took about 10 years between my bachelor's degree and going back for grad school because I was really just kind of thinking through um, a lot of the, the experiences I was having. And I worked at Glacier National Park in Montana, and that was like my first exposure to cryosphere and looking at the pictures of the glaciers from 100 years ago versus what we were seeing then, and obviously noticing that there's you know been some significant changes. And it was really through the combined experiences um, including working at a ranch in Southern California where I got exposure to some of the, the water issues and the wildfire issues that I started kind of thinking about, you know, how we conceive of Homeland Security. And obviously post 9-11, when Department of Homeland Security was created, it was very much focused for good reason on counterterrorism. But when you kind of look at climate science combined with the challenges that we're already seeing, it becomes very clear that we need to be open to widening the aperture to understanding the kind of foundation of what creates the conditions for a society to thrive. And at the base of that are things like food security, water security, housing security. And, and so I, it was really through that kind of interest in seeing um, kind of a, a disconnect between the way that 
Homeland Security strategy was talked about versus the changes that were obviously coming down the pike when you start looking at all the scientific research that was being done. That really spurred me to say, okay, I want to bring my environmental science background and do a hard security master's program so I can really get exposure to the way that the security community thinks about security, right? And what are the the theories and philosophies and doctrines that inform that thinking to be able to kind of find a way to bridge the two and how do we better account for something like climate change within the the scope of of the field of security studies and because the arctic is changing faster than anywhere it and it, its changes are of immense consequence to the entire world it just seemed like the most obvious place to be able to make that case about why these changes matter in a way that's completely divorced from any type of political rhetoric right because there's a real issue around the way that climate change has unfortunately been politicized that's really hindered our ability to just have an honest approach towards the way that the threat environment is changing and what it means to adapt to be able to be better positioned to deal with it yeah that's that's such a great start to our conversation jeff and i kind of talk about the politicization of you know weather and climate and 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 it's unfortunate that it does happen also got uh, Dr. Eric Hunt on on with us um, as a guest host this time, but I wanted to, um, uh, before I let them ask a couple of questions here, I, I wanted to bring up a book that actually my my 14 year old son um, got for Christmas. It's called Prisoners of Geography. And there's a chapter at the end of that, it's by Tim Marshall. And I just wanna read a, a snippet out of that um, just real quick, cause it speaks to exactly what you just said. Um, book says, all the sovereignty issues in the Arctic stem from the same desires and fears, the desire to safeguard routes for military and commercial shipping, the desire to own the natural riches of the region, and the fear that others may gain where you lose. Until recently, the riches were theoretical, but the melting ice has made the theoretical probable, and in some cases, certain. The effects of the melting ice won't just be felt in the Arctic. Countries as far away as the Maldives, Bangladesh, and the Netherlands are at risk of increased flooding as the ice melts and sea levels rise, these ramifications are why the Arctic is a global, not just a regional issue. And and you wrote recently, you had a, a chapter in a recent report um, that was talking about kind of that nexus of climate security and the impact on our militaries. Maybe you can uh, describe uh, a little bit of that work in, in writing that chapter and, and kind of what you're doing at, at the Wilson Center. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I think that excerpt from the book is an an apt description. So yeah, basically I had written a chapter for the pre-read to the Munich Security Conference Arctic Security Roundtable. And my chapter focused on the implications of climate change for military operations in the Arctic. And my thinking with developing this chapter was really to, to first, you know, discuss the direct impacts. So things like the the change that the Arctic is seeing in terms of the shift from the dominant form of precipitation being snow to it being rain and the way that rain on snow creates more ice and you get a lot more um, ice to deal with. And that has immense consequences for operations and Um, can be really hazardous, but it also has implications for underground infrastructure that normally gets buffered by a continuous snow layer during the winter. And so when you have these, these heat spells in the winter that cause that snow to melt, and then you get ice on top, there are assumptions that we have made about the ability for infrastructure to be buffered from these extreme temperatures that we really have to be questioning. And so that's just one example, but it my chapter kind of not only talks about those first order direct impacts, but also some of the other considerations that need to go into planning. And so that also includes the fact that as the Arctic Ocean is becoming more accessible, there's basically going to be more activity from different sectors. So, you know, more military activity due to the circumstances 
in you know that Russia of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. Um, you know there are concerns about you know Arctic security issues and how important that region is to to the way that Russia thinks about its own national security and um, is its security posture. Um, but so we'll be seeing more military exercises, but there's also concerns around uh, subsistence activities. So, you know, looking at local food security and people having to go further for harvesting certain types of marine life because of all the ecosystem upheaval that we're seeing and the changing predator prey dynamics and ecosystem conditions that are just causing changes that we have never seen before in in lived memory. And so there there is this idea that we will need to be aware of the fact that there are different types of legitimate activity that are increasing in this region that really it, it's in our interest to try to deconflict them where possible. And so that's where there's one of the things I was thinking about, for instance, is if the migration patterns are changing for certain types of marine animals and the military is planning an exercise, you know, having perhaps better conversations with some of the indigenous peoples and the scientists in the region to be able to maybe, you know, where possible, tweak the timing of an exercise so that it's not coinciding with something that might have an, you know, an impact on marine life. And just kind of more of those kinds of conversations, because we're seeing changes that we just have are extraordinary and that we have never experienced before. And so it's going to be really important to be as agile as possible um, and, and obviously, when it comes to, you know, military security issues, there's, you know, only certain things are in our control. But, you know, something like Russia being so aggressive in Europe, it really is necessary for NATO to be exercising more in the Arctic to have that operational capability as a deterrent. So it's really just about how do we grapple with the complexity of the reality that we're dealing with and understand how we need to think about that that climate level of analysis at every level of, of planning, whether it's at the operational um, all the way up to, you know, strategy. So, Maris, I was wondering if you actually could, uh, uh, just for our audience, name the other uh, member states, the Arctic Council? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the the Arctic is essentially the area above 66 degrees north, but there are different technical definitions of it for different treaties and agreements. And so uh, so the technical definition may change, but there are eight Arctic states and that never changes. So uh, the members of the Arctic Council that are the Arctic states are the United States because of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, which is still in the Kingdom of Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. I have a question. It's probably the most important question of the entire podcast. Of course it would. It's your question, Jeff. <laughs> so <laughs> on Twitter, and in fact, I, I, I think Marisol, you may have actually linked to the article. It was zombie viruses are thawing in the melting permafrost because of climate change. What says you? <laughs> um yeah so that's definitely something that we're concerned about in terms of the permafrost that's thawing so this is permafrost is usually ground that is permanently frozen that has an active layer on top that will kind of thaw a little bit during the summer but otherwise the ground stays frozen because it just never got enough to thaw and so you basically have Everything from, uh, you know, millions of years of life that is that is basically in this soil. In some places, it's very deep in the permafrost. And so uh, you'll actually have viruses and fungi and bacteria from millions of years ago that are starting to be exposed to oxygen and in some cases, reanimating. And you also have things like you know, smallpox graveyards and 
animals that had died of certain diseases and their carcasses are being exposed due to the the saw and and heaving of the land uh, because in some cases you're getting these very dramatic basically like methane explosions especially in the russian arctic where you'll just all of a sudden that gas builds up because it's warming up and you get more of that microbial activity and you'll just get this explosion these craters are appearing and not only is that concerning in terms of the types of you know from a biosecurity perspective it's also not accounted for in terms of the methane that's coming out and how that is entering the atmosphere in large quantities, that's not accounted for in our climate models or in our carbon budget. And so that's also why we're seeing a real disconnect in terms of how we're seeing changes faster than we've been predicting. But yes, the from a biosecurity perspective, there are serious questions about what's coming out of the permafrost and not only what's coming out, but how it's being handled in the lab. Right. And I think especially um, coming out of, you know, the COVID pandemic or kind of still in it, there's more attention being paid to the practices of certain labs. And there was just a report that came out on the labs that handle the most virulent materials and their safety practices and what China is developing. And it is like it just seems completely inappropriate, you know, and just um, very concerning. So, uh, and there was already in 2018, I believe it was 2018, there was an incident where um, an anthrax carcass uh, was exposed, you know, through the permafrost thaw, and uh, a nearby caribou herd ended up getting reinfected, and then a child that was out playing on the tundra, this is in Russia, um, ended up contracting it and died. Um, so things like that are, are concerning. I can't help but keep thinking about World War Z and <laughs> what might happen. No, it's I'm going to start being, out of the Arctic. Yeah, I'm being a little oh. dramatic, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting, though. Um, there are a lot of things being thawed. Yeah. Actually, we just talked about the cryosphere in class yesterday. Uh, we, we talked about the infrastructure risks from melting permafrost. Um, I hadn't actually thought about this being a biosecurity issue as well, but that doesn't make sense. Um, so not only are we enhancing the positive feedback of climate change with methane release, then you also could be potentially greatly increasing uh, the, you know, new viruses that we either have never seen in our lifetimes or you know, things from millions of years ago coming back. That's uh, frightening. Yeah, one, one of the things, Marisol, to, to what Eric was just talking about is tipping points, right? You know, Arctic becoming ice-free, the ramifications that uh, the Arctic becoming ice-free, there are certain tipping points that uh, are mentioned in some of the latest IPCC reports. How soon could we see an, an ice-free Arctic that uh, from the data that you're looking at and, and, and from your lens, what are those ramifications? Can I ask you to define ice-free first, Marisol? Yeah. So when we talk about the how much sea ice there is, we're really looking at when it will be ice-free first in the summer, right? But overall, the trend is that there is a thinning and shrinking polar ice cap. And so it's not just getting smaller. It's also getting it's younger ice. We're losing that multi-year ice. And so essentially, um, I don't know the exact definition of ice free. I I think it kind of depends on what industry you're coming from, because like the shipping industry would have a different definition than maybe like, you know, a, a cryosphere scientist. Right. But in terms of the region becoming accessible so that a transpolar route would actually be viable we're not that far away from that being a possibility during the summer, which is when we see that, that sea ice minimum. And what I've been seeing is that time frame in which we're expecting that slowly getting closer and closer. And the latest I've been seeing is 
pretty solid evidence that it could be as soon as 2035. So, of course, there's interest from the shipping industry because of how this would be a much shorter route than, you know, going all the way safely you know, from Asia to Europe, going down through the Suez. Even taking the Northern Sea Route cuts about two weeks off of that transit time. But a transpolar route would be of interest to an actor like China, uh, for instance, because they could avoid having to pay the, the tolls that Russia charges and the way that Russia views their ability to regulate the Northern Sea Route. But there's, and that's a huge but, <laughs> um, I can't convey enough like that unpredictability is really the, the more dominant uh, operational hazard right now because you it can be ice free but then you you get these extreme changes in conditions really rapidly and I think that there was there was an incident two years ago in or a year and a half ago in the Russian Arctic in in the fall of, of 2021 and the like over a dozen ships got stuck in the northern sea route because they were thinking oh okay it's going to be more ice free so we can do this you know uh, we can transit the route later in the year in october and it'll be fine because russia really talks it up as oh you know the the arctic sea ice is diminishing and yes that's the overall trend but it's very very hazardous and unpredictable in the interim time and it took months for russia to be able to be able to get icebreakers out there to create channels to get these ships out. And so I think that incident was a real wake up call that, okay, you know, the way that some, some people talk about the prospects of these Arctic shipping routes being viable, first of all, or, you know, much less alternatives to the Suez, you know, there's, there's a real disconnect. Uh, and we also do not have the infrastructure to support a transpolar route. We do not have the search and rescue capability. If there was some type of incident, you would be uh, waiting a very long time, you know, days, if not a week for somebody to be able to respond. I'm, I'm thinking that you're suggesting that if we buy the polar cruise to get the insurance. <laughs> <laughs> just one interpretation okay. so <laughs> would that still be the coast guard's responsibility for search and rescue in that area that was on u.s territory so uh if it's in u.s territory yes and so that's also where you know district 17 is is the coast guard district that that takes care of the the arctic or the you know the american arctic and they essentially have a growing area of responsibility with very limited support infrastructure and very limited surface assets. And that's where something like our icebreaker, like catastrophe comes into play uh, because we only have two icebreakers. One of them is dedicated to Antarctica. So the other side of the world. And then we have, one icebreaker Healy that is dedicated to the Arctic, but you know, she was built in 1999. You know, we're, we really need to have self rescue capability. So having another one is an absolute must, but we just need to be able to provide Coast Guard with the tools that they need in order to meet their 11 missions in their area of responsibility. Um, and, and so that's even things like, uh, you know, we'll be developing a, a deep water port uh, on off the coast of Nome in Alaska. Right now, the only deep draft port is uh, along the Aleutian Island chain um, out of Dutch Harbor, which is very, very far in terms of distance from from there up to, you know, for instance, the North Slope. But there's also uh, cooperation among the Arctic states through the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. And also there was a, an agreement signed on search and rescue that basically puts the Arctic into a pie chart and shows the ways that different states are agreeing to respond in certain areas or to work together in a response. And this is actually something where the U.S. and Russia do continue to 
to cooperate because of how extraordinary the the circumstances are of you know if there is some type of incident in the Bering Sea or the Chukchi Sea being able to respond in a timely manner to protect life at sea and to prevent environmental pollution spreading in a you know a very austere region and very fragile um, is, is of the utmost importance. And so that's been something we've been able to continue to work with them on. Well, and I mean, just as a frame of reference, right, you, you mentioned the one or two icebreakers that the U.S. has. I mean, for context here, Russia's got like 30 to 40. Um, and I mean, if you combined all of the nations that have icebreakers, you would probably barely get to that 30 or 40. Um, I, I, I'm not going to do public math, but it's close, right? Um, so there, it is good to to hear that there is some level of cooperation. You know, I, my understanding, uh, Russia is still leading the Arctic Council, right? Um, they're they're currently the the chair of the, the Arctic Council. It's a it's a rotating chair, right? Um, I, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about some of the other areas. Um, of cooperation so you know this this podcast we you know we focus on weather and climate technology and society on the triple point so for jeff and i coming out of the military one of the things that we saw our military doing with other countries was you know security cooperation and one of the avenues to do that was you know weather and climate affect all of us right what are are there some areas that you're seeing that cooperation on you know weather and climate information, whether that's sensing or observations, or, or is that even that still sort of on the competitive confrontational continuum? Yeah, so this is where Russia's decision to invade Ukraine has been just truly extraordinary. And the, I mean, the impacts of the war alone have been horrendous and just absolutely, you know, heartbreaking. Uh, but then you add the opportunity cost on top of that, because there was a lot of momentum within the the Arctic Council, for instance, which is the the premier body for intergovernmental cooperation in the Arctic on areas of of mutual interest. So things like climate change, sustainable development, and and larger scientific cooperation. And so basically, with with the war, um, this body has was put on pause by the the seven Arctic states, aside from Russia. Uh, Russia was chair of this body, and it was really important to deny them the political platform that's typically afforded the chair. And the working group activities, which is where the the real meat of the Arctic Council cooperation with with scientists and indigenous peoples and um, all sorts of experts, social scientists, et cetera, where they really come together and really get to uh, tackle the meat and substance of the work plan that's developed um, with by consensus among the eight Arctic states for that two year chairmanship. And so that was paused because of the war. And then there was concern from, you know, some of the indigenous groups and, and other people who live in the Arctic that, you know, these changes are not stopping because it's not a politically convenient time to work together. So we need to find a way to work, work on these issues. And so there is a limited resumption of working group activity in the Arctic Council that does not include Russia. And so that work has been able to continue, but very handicapped because basically their ability to uh, create reports and to inform the, procedurally the next chairmanship is, is really handicapped. So it, it's really not ideal. And on top of that, there has been a massive brain drain from Russia in terms of people that have fled the country. A lot of those are, are, are scientists and, and other people who are really working on these issues for Russia. Um, but, you know, the U.S. stance is that government to government cooperation is essentially impossible under these current circumstances, um, with limited exceptions. 
but that at the sub-government level, you know, so universities or individuals, uh, scientists, you're still able to reach out to your Russian colleagues if you want to talk with them or, you know, work with them on a project. But the issue is also, you know, Russia's domestic oppression of their people and the way that they've been learning from China in terms of domestic surveillance and really an expansion of their foreign agent laws, where for something as little as a Zoom call, a Russian could be accused of being a foreign agent and and really have their life you know turned upside down. So there is concern about even you know reaching out to people that you know in Russia because of the way that you know if somebody doesn't like them they could use that as an excuse. So there are serious issues in terms of the data gaps uh, with things like methane monitoring. So there's one project called the Permafrost Pathways, uh, which was seeking is seeking to create pan-Arctic methane monitoring. And one of the dimensions of that project was to have ground-based monitoring through these flux stations in the Russian Arctic. But because of the war, that was no longer an option. And, and largely, data sharing from Russia has stopped. Um, and, and so they had to kind of recalibrate and say, all right, what, what's the other option? And so they changed the plan to put those, that ground-based monitoring in Canada instead. So there are ways to be able to adapt certain projects. But Russia is over 50% of the Arctic. It's 11 time zones big, and about 60% of it is underlaid by permafrost. And so this is a massive data gap. Um, and there's only so much that satellites and remote sensing can, can compensate for. And so that's, that's really a challenge. So you talked about some of the data gaps and some of the issues with, obviously, the geographic space that they take up are you familiar with any of the numerical weather modeling or any type of modeling whether it be ai or ml or or traditional physics based modeling that have uh, made any improvements or are we um, kind of stuck in the uh, in the cold war era of arctic modeling uh, so I am definitely not somebody who is super in the weeds with actual models. I just talk to the people who understand how they work and they tell me, you know, what's good and what's not. And, or, you know, I'll read different reports, but, but basically I, I do know that permafrost thaw is very poorly accounted for in, in terms of the, the natural emissions, right? So for something like methane, we have better monitoring of the anthropogenic side around the oil and gas industry. But because of the vast expanses of land and sea, seabed, where we have permafrost thawing and methane being released, our monitoring is, is very limited. And that's a known challenge. Um, and About how long has that monitoring been going on? That's a great question. I'm not totally sure how far back it goes. So, I mean, is it fair to say that maybe we don't model natural methane emissions from permafrost very well because historically we haven't had that? Oh, yeah. Well, it was just not something like there was no reason to be monitoring Measuring it. Because it. it. Yeah, like it wasn't yeah. changing as much as like, you know, there were some changes I know, like, you know, back in the 50s, but it was very minor, right? And so we've really seen this acceleration of thawing and a realization that, you know, this is now essentially the equivalent of a top 10 country emitter. It's about the same emissions as Japan. In terms of methane or all greenhouse gases? Is methane? And I think it's in terms of methane. Regardless, it's you know bad from the standpoint that methane is significantly more potent than CO two in terms of its concentration. But this speaks to the broader issue, right? Um, and and Jeff and I have hit on this in previous episodes. And models need data, 
and when you have data deserts or data, you know, data sparse locations, whether that's over water, it's a huge data sparse area. Um, so the o open oceans, um, there's certainly continental reaches that are very data sparse, like in Africa, uh, parts of parts of Russia. But the Arctic is absolutely data sparse um, in a huge data desert, right? And so if you don't have the model data, or if you don't have the sensing data, um, the in-situ sensing data, especially, um, yes, you can make up with make up some of that with uh, your remote sensing, your polar orbiting, especially um, kind of sense data. But uh, because we don't have those sensing, whether it's weather sensing, whether it's uh, atmospheric concentration like methane, if we don't have that sensing, then obviously you know it's it's very difficult to build a model on it. It's it's even difficult to do any sort of AI or high order statistics because. You ultimately need data to feed those models, right? So it's it's it it's, it sounds like a huge limiting factor. That's obviously more complicated because of the situation with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, it absolutely is. And one of the other issues is that a lot of the data is collected seasonally. Uh, so you know we have certain certain sensors or you know certain places where data is being collected year round that you know in situ data but there are issues especially because of polar night and how long uh that lasts in the arctic that certain types of of satellites basically have a hard time collecting year round right because of either clouds or um just how dark it is and so there are, are issues with basically the ability to be able to understand not just the changes that we're seeing at one point in time, monitoring it in a comprehensive way, but also how that seasonal flux ties in to th those changes. And that's very significant as well and, and something that is a known gap. So I guess one question uh, on my mind. So the other angle I often take with the podcast is asking about commercial stuff, right? So like from a weather climate business perspective, what are some opportunities for the existing companies that are out there? So for instance, Ryan and I have collected this like little miniature database of 200 plus, almost probably 300 weather companies, weather or environmental or, you know, climate companies. And they offer things from data services to products to sensors and all sorts of value propositions. What do you see? I mean, maybe you don't come from a business uh, background, but like, what do you see as economic, you know, happening in the economic realm or in the business realm uh, with, with the Arctic situation? Yeah, well, I think there's a, a huge array of, of business ideas for the Arctic because of how much of a need there is um, from a scientific perspective, but also because of the desire to facilitate greater sustainable development in the region. Um, so one company that has definitely stood out to me is Sail Drone and the way that they have really grown in, in the last several years. Um, when I was up in the Arctic Ocean with Coast Guard on, on Healy, our icebreaker in 2019, one of the scientists that was on board uh, called the sail drone over and recalibrated it. And we just had to kind of go up to one point in the Arctic where we were going to be recovering some buoys for some other scientists. And we just were able to tweak it so that it was close enough that she could call the sail drone over. And so it was really cool to get to, to see one of those. And they're just so agile in the way that they're able to collect data. And I know that there's another one that's similar, another company that's called Ocean Arrow that's like sail drone, but it can dive. And so these are really great, uh, really interesting ideas for you know businesses that are able to really add a lot of value and are really innovative and just you know just becoming more and more relevant um anything relating to domain awareness in the arctic uh 
I mean, especially in this, you know, post February, 2022 environment, um, you know, as NORAD is undergoing modernization and we're just being challenged with new things like, you know, Chinese balloons that are just oh wandering off course and nothing to see here, but just that ability to, whether it's having to do with environmental change or some type of actor based activity, we need to be able to detect anything that's happening and to track it and to have that ability to respond in a timely manner. And that's a, a challenge, you know, in multiple respects, but it's also something that I think there's a lot of uh, ways that we can really stack functionality to contribute to better data collection around environmental change that also helps to increase domain awareness for homeland security and other, you know, continental defense purposes. Well, that that's a really interesting couple of vignettes you paint there. Um, the, the sail drone vignette, um, you know, we could have a whole podcast episode on the Chinese balloon here. We'll probably save that for another show, but, uh, because it, I mean, it is, it is somewhat, uh, weather related, of course. Well, actually, but to that point, I mean, so China's saying that this was related to their meteorological research and they want to be engaging in a much larger way in the Arctic with research. But by them doing this, right, with this incident with the balloon, they're making it much harder for any reasonable person to be like, yes, China, we would like to increase our cooperation with you on you know climate science in the region because clearly you know nothing's going to go off track and you have complete control <laughs> over all of your collection devices and there's no dual use <laughs> the, the, the the thing i thought about though is like when they said you know it was a weather balloon that was blown off course and this and i'm like well you're either lying or you have really bad meteorologists. <laughs> one of those, one of those is the case here. So, uh, Eric, you had something you were going to ask. Well, yes, actually, I was actually going to ask Mirasol what um, role China is having currently in the Arctic, or what they are maybe planning. If you can speak to that. Yeah. So, China has been interested for for quite some time in in polar research they have a arctic research station on svalbard and you know a couple other places in the arctic but it's really since 2018 when they issued this famous white paper that where they referred to themselves as a near arctic state which is not a thing um that you know, they've been kind of more aggressively pursuing their interests in the region. And on paper, they are building equities in a way that, you know, mostly abides by international law and, you know, shows respect for sovereignty. But all of this is something that they could use in the future to argue for why they should have a larger role in regional discussions and regional decision making. And so their interests are really in, of course, the shortened shipping route between Asia and Europe through the Northern Sea Route, or maybe a transpolar route. There are width and depth constraints along the Northern Sea Route, though, that are very notable. So like the mega container ships that go through the Suez would literally not fit along the Northern Sea Route. Um, but they are interested in the shipping. They're interested in the way that fish are migrating towards the polar regions as the equatorial regions are getting warmer. Um, so, you know, we're looking and all, you know, everybody's interested in the way that fish are migrating. Um, and then and, and the ha habitats are shifting and the ecosystem changes. Um, but also because of the disproportionate impact that Arctic cryosphere degradation has on global sea level rise, China talks about themselves as being a near Arctic state, partially because of the way that they are experiencing uh, sea level rise in a disproportionately high way, which is true, but everywhere in the world is impacted 
by Arctic change. And so it's really, you know, it's not something that's uh, specific to them. But with the war in Ukraine, that has really put Russia in a bind because it did not take place over just three days, right? It's obviously this prolonged, uh, you know, conflict and, you know, really this, just a war of attrition at this point. And so basically what we're seeing is that Russia has lost a lot of the their partners for all sorts of cooperation, including commercial exploits. And Russia sees it as a matter of their national security to be able to realize the economic potential of their Arctic zone. And so they're basically just looking for whoever will come in and do business with them and help them to develop their resources, uh, especially the fossil fuel resources. They're very concerned about stranded assets. And so they want to be able to develop these as quickly as possible and get them to market. And so you see China coming in and really offering in a more concerted way to be a primary investor in some of these projects. And it was just announced after the Putin-Xi meeting in Moscow um, a couple of days ago that they're actually going to be creating a, a joint plan for development of the Northern Sea Route, which is very significant because Russia and China have a complex history that's not all as rosy as they make it seem. But basically, Russia, it really is beholden to China. And so they they will be making concessions that they would never have previously considered and they had really been cautious about the way that they would engage China in the Russian Arctic. Like you would not see a Russian Chinese military exercise in the Russian Arctic, right? Like this is their, you know, they have their whole bastion defense concept, their strategic subs based out of the Kola Peninsula. They have, you know, just this very strong sense of, you know, the Russian Arctic that they want to protect and that they want to control. And it's it is concerning to them that China is this growing power, and you know they have a very long land border. But mm-hmm. essentially, you know they're they're going to be willing to to do things they would not have normally, and and that's yeah. including it, with this really extraordinary announcement about uh, a dual cooperation. Plan. Yeah, sure. And it almost sounds like they've made themselves more beholden to China because of the invasion of Ukraine. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 One of the themes I keep continue to post on LinkedIn is, you know, the the, the fact that we don't think through second, third, and fourth order uh, implications of our actions, right? Uh, and that's on an individual level. In this case, it's on a, on a country level. Um, uh, I- invading a, a, a neighbor nation uh, like Ukraine is not not as simple as uh, as certainly Putin probably was hoping. Um, so maybe a new world order with this uh, this joint venture potentially with China. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, given given their geopolitical history, like you said, that uh, could be complicated. So this has been a fascinating discussion, um, and I, I want to one of the last questions I, I wanted to throw at you, Marisol, before we. Uh, get into the lightning round is, and I'll channel my inner Jeff um, here for a second. Um, we like to make sure that this podcast is accessible to students. So you shared a a story about, uh, you know, the the sail drone interaction, and that sounded like a really interesting kind of aspect. You got to be on the Healy up in the Arctic. It sounds like you've gotten some really cool experiences. So for those out there that want to embark on Arctic security work, um, what kind of advice do you have? Is there a story that you'd like to share beyond what you've already shared with us? Or what kind of advice would you have for, for students um, who, who might be interested in the Arctic? Yeah. Um, so first of all, we definitely need to be building our Arctic workforce. We actually just had an event uh, it was Wilson Center, Ted Stevens Center, uh, co-hosted an event that was on this exact topic of how do we support, um, you know, this next generation. And, you know, there are slowly, as the U.S. is realizing that the Arctic 
really does matter. And this is going to be a region where we will have enduring presence and you know, very much, you know, geostrategic persistent interests. We're building our structural presence, right, through things like the Ted Stevens Center, through this new um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Arctic and Global Resilience Office at the Pentagon. We have, um, a, you know, hopefully soon to be confirmed ambassador to the Arctic, and, and they're seeking to codify that position so that it will also persist across administrations. You know, we have, you know, a, a consulate now in Nuuk, the capital of Greenland. So there are, you know, from the U.S. government perspective, there are ways to, you know, be in government and work in, in Arctic. Um, but in general, I would say that to students, the past is not a good indicator of the present and future conditions that we will be dealing with. And so I think that really more now than ever, you should really like have confidence in, in your, if you, if you are putting together some non-traditional factors and you think that this is something that needs to be paid more attention to, that that's something that you should really pursue because that's how I came to this work right, was like, there was no senior Arctic analyst position. This was created because I made the argument for it. And they were like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, it's just about finding the the people who kind of understand the, you know, the different pieces of the puzzle and that can kind of help you to connect things in certain ways and, and to connect things from an intellectual standpoint to, you know, the bureaucratic structures that we're dealing with. And, and how do you start to incorporate new ways of thinking? Um, and we're going to need more and more of that because of just how much disruption we will be dealing with. And I would also say that, you know, for getting Arctic experience, you know, there are more organizations that are working on Arctic issues. And of course, Polar Institute at the Wilson Center where I work we do have internships in the the fall, the summer, and the spring. Um, they're paid now, thank goodness. <laughs> um, and and there's a lot of other organizations out there that are trying to support uh, students and minorities who are interested in in Arctic issues. Not to mention the vast array of scientific jobs that are available related to polar studies. Well, this has been great. We, we've come full circle from your beginnings, you know, not necessarily uh, associated with the Arctic when you first started on your journey to, you know, finding this interesting little niche to, you know, bringing it home for folks who, uh, students or others that might want to get involved. It's been a fascinating discussion, Marisol. And so we like to end our show with our guests with uh, three quick lightning round questions. The first is, what is the most memorable weather event in your life? I would say it was when I was hiking the presidential range of the White Mountains and summiting Mount Washington in July, and it started hailing. And I know that that is one of the most dangerous mountains in the United States and has extremely unpredictable weather. And we had started and it was started hiking, you know, and it was 70 something degrees and sunny. And by the time we get to the top of Mount Washington, it's hailing on us. And that was an amazing <laughs> extreme to experience. And I'll always remember that. That's definitely memorable. So vacation, beach or mountains? I would say both. <laughs> 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 I, I would I would definitely find some mountains that were close to a coastline, you know, like Acadia National Park in Maine. You know, you go hiking, get some, you know, good exercise, and then you go find a beach and you eat a lobster roll yeah. and it's delicious. So there you go. Not going to take a vacation in Iowa then. <laughs> no. So so uh my family and I, my wife and I took a trip to New Zealand and that's the, that's the place that we're looking for is like, so the, the way that the locals talked about it, and, and I think it's Kaikoura, I can't remember the, the exact uh, town, but literally the way the locals talked about it is, 
they would go skiing in the morning and then they'd get their surfboard and they'd go surfing in the afternoon. It was, oh, wow. it was glorious for yeah, them. That's amazing. That's awesome. All right. Uh, last question. What is your superpower? I think my superpower is the ability to connect seemingly disparate dots and to really see a bigger picture. But sometimes it's hard to explain that in a way that makes sense to people who don't think in the same way. But I think that's really allowed me to understand why certain factors that have traditionally been excluded from the factors considered when you think about security to understand why those actually are starting to play a larger role and need to be better accounted for. So I'd say that that I guess would be my my superpower. That's awesome. And, and maybe that's how we originally connected because I, I feel a kinship to that too. It's just great when you're able to help make the light bulb come on you know, for maybe two parties or whatever the case is that, uh, whether it's on a security issue or whatever the case is. So Marisol, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Trip Point podcast. Uh, and Eric, it's, it's been great to have you on as a guest host this week or this month. Um, and uh, thanks so much for, again for joining the show, Marisol. Thank you so much. This is really fun. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Triple Point podcast. If you liked it, subscribe to our newsletter at triplepointpodcast.com. Give us a shout and a five-star rating on your favorite podcast station and tell your friends about it. Or you can email us at triplepointpodcast at the number 81degrees.com. Until next time, have a great week.